Israel's war on Gaza has displaced nearly 2 million Palestinians. A majority of them are sheltering in the city of Rafah in the south. Now, with the threat of an Israeli ground offensive on the area and calls by its politicians to permanently expel Palestinians from the Strip, fears are growing of yet another forced population transfer. People in Power investigates. We should create a humanitarian problem that will force Egypt and Turkey and Europe to absorb the Arabs as uh, uh, refugees. The purpose of the Zionist project was the erasure of the Palestinian people. The methodology was mostly expulsion, intimidation and massacres. No, <laughs> Since October 7th, 2023, about 2 million Palestinians in the Gaza Strip have had to flee for their lives to escape death and destruction, which has followed them even in areas they've been told are safe zones. Israel's war on Gaza has wrought an unprecedented humanitarian disaster. Pushed to and cornered in Rafah through air and land assaults by the Israeli army, Gazans fear the worst. <laughs> People in power set out to investigate if population transfer of the Palestinians in Gaza and the occupied West Bank is Israel's ultimate goal. As of February 21st, 2024, close to 30,000 Palestinians have been killed by the Israeli army and more than 60,000 wounded and maimed. Thousands more are missing, many presumed dead under the rubble. Israel's real aim is clear, is to empty the land of Palestinians. Marwan al Asher, Jordan's former foreign minister and once ambassador to both Washington and Tel Aviv, has long been involved in Arab-Israeli relations. Israel is obliterating all forms of life in Gaza, not just human life, but the infrastructure, the schools, the places of worship, uh, the hospitals, in a clear attempt to make Gaza uninhabitable so that Palestinians are forced to leave. Jordan has taken the lead in warning the world about the dangers of large-scale population transfers of Palestinians. I, I think uh, on the first part of the question on the issues of refugees coming to Jordan, and I think I can quite strongly speak on behalf not only of Jordan as a nation, but of uh, our friends in Egypt, that is a red line. Uh, because I think that is the plan by certain of the usual suspects to try and create de facto issues on the ground. No refugees in Jordan, no refugees in Egypt. A lot of people in the West uh, look at this uh, and say, how can people you know, not allow uh, Palestinians to get in? But in fact, this is a position coordinated with the Palestinians themselves who have learned the lesson from 1948, who do not wish to leave. Uh, and so the, the decision to close the border is actually a decision not to allow Israel to solve the conflict at the Palestinians' expense uh, and drive Palestinians out of their land. Most UN member states, including Western powers, have expressed concerns for the fate of Gaza's 2.3 million people. They have publicly condemned Israeli politicians and leaders who call for the expulsion of the Palestinians. On January 28th, at least 10 Israeli cabinet ministers participated in a Resettle Gaza event in Jerusalem. Israeli National Security Minister Etamir Ben-Gvir addressed a cheering crowd. 
שצריך להציל את מושבים בצפון השומרון על ידי המבצע תפקידה לקבל החלטות אמיצות There will be no Arabs in the Gaza Strip. They will go to Turkey, to Scotland, to Britain. I want them out of Gaza. And we'll use different methods. One of them is not to give them any humanitarian aid. So the countries of the world will have pity on them and take them. At one of the few entry points into Gaza, Israeli settlers storm aid convoys, preventing them from delivering food and medicine. One of the families waiting for aid is that of Amira Jaji. In October 2023, they fled Gaza City to a refugee camp in Rafah after their home was bombarded and their neighborhood destroyed. Experts say plans to displace and transfer these Palestinians began decades ago. The most important method used by these European Jewish settlers to take over a land that will belong to the Palestinians and build their own homeland on it, the main method they were using was ethnic cleansing, expulsion, transfer if you want. Professor Ilan Pape is Israel's foremost historian on the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. It really begins in the late 19th century when an ideological movement called Zionism uh, decides that the best way to solve the problem of anti-Semitism in Europe and the best way for a modern future for the Jewish people is in the land of Palestine. So in that period between the late 19th century and the end of the First World War, Zionism becomes a fact on the ground in Palestine. At the time, it was the United Kingdom which was a chief architect and ally of Zionist aspirations in Palestine. The British ruled Palestine as part of their colonial portfolio between 1918 and 1948. So in the mid-1920s, the Zionist movement succeeds in buying land in Palestine, in two places called Wadi Hawaris and Marj ibn Ammar. Before Zionism, people also bought land. There were transactions. But the custom was the villagers who lived there for centuries remain. I mean, the change of ownership does not uproot. The Zionists, as landowners, the first thing they do, they go to the British government and say, you should evict the villages. So already in 1926, they evicted 11 villages, uh, which means few thousand people, were the first Palestinian victims of ethnic uh, cleansing. Deprived of their farmlands, expelled Palestinian villagers became part of the urban working class. Over the next decade, Palestinian resistance against Zionist settlers took the form of strikes and rallies and increasingly armed resistance. Killings of Palestinian leaders by the British contributed to the 1936 Arab Revolt. After the revolt, the British sent a commission to Palestine and the commission was the first to think of the idea of two states. It included the relocation, the term was, of some of the population. Professor Assam Nassar is a Palestinian historian whose focus is the history of the British Mandate period. The main champion at the time was someone with the name of Yusuf Weitz. And Weitz was the head of the Jewish National Fund, whose job was to acquire lands for Jewish use only. Uh, the discussions went further to the level that they started to think of where do we move these Palestinians. So when we reach the end of the mandate, that is May 1948, you can see that the Zionist movement managed to buy 5 to 6 percent of the land of Palestine. That's all. Because people resisted uh, and uh, not everybody was willing to send land, understanding that purchase of land immediately is followed by eviction of people. 
It's a settler colonial movement of a project of displacement and replacement. Like all settler colonial movements, if they don't complete the takeover of the land and the transfer of the people, they will continue. Because they really believe ideologically that without a total control of the land geographically, but also demographically, namely to have an absolute majority or just an absolute presence. That's also the main motivation for the Israeli actions today in the Gaza Strip, and also it's the Israeli plans for the day after. While the refugees in Rafah ponder their day after moment, that day came for Yaqub Aoudi in the spring of 1948 when Zionist forces expelled them from their home in Lifta, outside Jerusalem, leaving their homes uninhabitable and banning them to this day from ever returning. Yaqub keeps his family property deeds, photos, and a house key from Lifta close to his heart. First of all, they prepare a master plan for the expulsion in March called Plan D, Plan Dalet. And in April and the beginning of May, they implement it. And the first stage of Plan D was to take over the urban space of Palestine. And they depopulate most of the Palestinian cities. Out of the 75,000 people who lived in Haifa, only 3,000 remain. Haifa's old Arab neighborhoods today are sprinkled with Arabic name signs here and there, and old photographs on the homes of those who were driven out. South of Haifa, Yaffa was another major Palestinian port city that was forcibly depopulated by Zionist forces. Sami Abu Shahadi's family was among the few that managed to remain. The main uh, tools for uh, ethnic cleansing of Palestine uh, between 1947 and 1949 was violence by different Zionist terrorist groups. At that time, the British called them terrorist groups. All the important Palestinian cities, Yaffa, Haifa, Akka, Lid, Ramli, people were expelled. If you are imagining what is, what is now being done to the Palestinians in Gaza, so they are pushing all the Palestinian population towards the city of Rafah, towards the border. And they said clearly that uh, their strategic plan is expulsion. And they said that the preferable scenario is total expulsion of 2.3 million people from Gaza to Sinai. And then they not also want to keep them in Sinai. They want to spread them all over the world. The Israeli Ministry of Intelligence on October 13th, 2023, recommended the forcible and permanent expulsion of the 2.3 million Palestinians in the Gaza Strip to Egypt's Sinai Peninsula. After a leaked copy was published by the Israeli magazine Plus 972, Israel's Ministry of Intelligence verified the authenticity of the document. The vast majority of Gaza's new refugees are descendants of families expelled from what is now Israel, including Amira Jaji and her family. I 
ونجري في الشوارع هي واخوي كان صغير عائدها وتقول اللي يجي عليه القنبله بسموها قنبله الناس اشلاء في الشوارع يعني والحمد لله شردوا منها وطلعت ايامها ابوي كان له حسكه اخذها وطلعها في الحسكه عن طريق البحر The majority were expelled uh, through the sea because Jaffa is a coastal city. Those who went south, I'm talking about tens of thousands of people, uh, were expelled to Gaza. Gaza is, only, Gaza is only 65 kilometers far from Jaffa. Juliet Touma is one of the few aid workers who's been able to enter Gaza during the war. Places like schools, for example, have to be converted into shelters, what we call. And even those shelters were never spared during the war. We have recorded more than 300 people who were killed during those hits and over a thousand people who were injured, only in UNRWA facilities. The so-called evacuation orders that the Israeli authorities um, kept on issuing, especially the first one, under which at least one million people were impacted. They created this sense of sheer panic, and people quite often just left and left everything behind. Experts say today's events are a continuation of a seven-decade-long Israeli practice of forcing Palestinians out of their homes and then barring them from ever returning. First of all, there was uh, uh, ethnic cleansing of about 300,000 Palestinians in the immediate aftermath of the June 67 war. Since 67 until uh, today, Israel used an incremental policy of ethnic cleansing. Around half a million Palestinians were uh, uh, expelled in one way or another or banned from returning, which is the same. Past policies demonstrate that attempts to empty Gaza are not new. In 1967, and there was a plan particularly of uh, reducing the number of refugees in Gaza. And there were talks about let's destroy the refugee camps and transfer this population to Jordan until Jordan started to prevent Gazans from entering Jordan. A total of 12,000 Gazans were let into Jordan in 1969 and temporarily settled in a refugee camp near Jerash. The Gaza camp is the poorest, most marginalized camp in Jordan. And that's because the residents of that camp, they don't have the national ID that they need to allow them to work. Nazal is a co-founder of a cooperative that helps Gazan women refugees in Jordan find culturally relevant employment. Amal Aradi is the descendant of Gazan Palestinians who were driven out of their homes twice by Israeli forces. أخوي دائما بلوم أبوي أنت إيش اللي طلعك ليش أنت بتطلع كان أنت ضليتك في بلدك بس بقول لي والله يا هبا اللي إحنا شفنا والتدمير اللي شفنا والذبح يعني خلانا نطلع غصب عنا وكنا إحنا صغار وما معنا أي وسيلة دفاع عن النفس فحاليا لما شفنا فعلا صار في غزة وشو صار فيهم يعني عن جد قلت يعني معكوا حق إنه أنتوا طلعتوا يعني كان إحنا ما نوجدنا فعليا so you can see over the past 75 years consistent attempts to erase Palestinian identity. Simple ways like co-opting hummus. <laughs> but Tatriz is a way for us to affirm the existence and continuity of the Palestinian identity. So now you see symbols like the watermelon, like embroidery, like the kefir, even without embroidery, being used within the global solidarity movement and within the Palestinian diaspora as a further confirmation, not only do we exist, but now everyone knows that we exist. Over the years, Jordan became a way station for millions of Palestinians pushed out of their homes and expelled into other countries. 
I am a descendant of a Jaro Sulamite family. God bless his soul, Abdul Hai, my father. He settles in Katamon, which is in the west part of Jerusalem, which was occupied in 48. So we were forced to leave or we were kicked out in the war of 48. These are parts of the structural and architectural plans of our home in Katamon. And I see the stamp date, and it says City Engineering Department, 4th of January, 1945. Well, this is, which I was very happy to see or find, my father's signature as an owner. And that's his name here, Abdul Hay Khalil Atiyah. Muhammad Ateyeh runs a farm in the Jordan Valley, right across from his birthplace in Jericho. He is one of up to four million Palestinian refugees in Jordan who await the moment they can return to their former homes. And we left Jericho when I was 13, during the war of 67. One of the things that is kept in my memory is how we left all the whole family, we were 12 children, and my mom, and maybe some of the neighbors, all backed in one vehicle. Well, I remember another thing that uh, Israeli planes were bombing people as they were leaving, talking about things repeating itself. And one family that was killed with an airplane, an Israeli airplane, was killed here not far from the farm. Across the Jordan River, in the occupied West Bank, Israel has walled in and isolated most urban areas and declared many rural communities closed military areas. Ain Samia, a community of 300, was declared a closed military zone in May 2023, and its residents expelled. In 2023 alone, a dozen such communities were banished at gunpoint. The people of Ain Samia now live in barracks less than 15 kilometers from their former homes. In 67, they took Israel. After that, in 69, they were going to go to here, and they were going to go to here, and they were going to go to here. In 69, they gave us 24 hours. They came to Ramallah. جبنا سيارة بتسريح اللي تعدى السيارة ما بطلع وطلعونا حطونا في سامي ولا تاريخ 15 شهر 5 اجت الشرطة اجت سيارتين جيش وثلاث سيارات مستوطنين من 67 الى تاريخ اليوم والله ما تريحت ساعة في الليل منهم والله انه ما احنا مهاجرين يا اما يذبحونا فيها يا اما نعيش فيها واحدة من هالثنتين In the occupied West Bank more than 300 Palestinians have been killed by both Israeli settlers and the army since the war in Gaza began in a parallel battlefield. Israel has a mechanism of about 200,000 people who are daily employed to police the Palestinians, wherever they are. Uh, and part of this policing is also dealing with uh, sometimes individual cases of ethnic cleansing, but it's uh, a perpetual reality. It doesn't, it doesn't end. What Jordan and Egypt today are doing is raising awareness in the international community to the question of mass transfer, uh, to Israel's real aims, so that such a scenario does not develop. We cannot uh, today say that mass transfer is a thing of the past that cannot be done. وكل هذا وصبرين وبنقول يا رب نروح بس يا رب نروح نرجع على دورنا والله اعتقد اني ارجع على داري بس لو يعني بدي اخذ الخيمه هذه وانصبها عند داري لانه دورنا مشوه الحمد لله رب العالمين ماكل قذائف ما قالت يا حالي فحنرجع ناخذ خيمتنا ونقعد احنا وهالاولاد ونكمل بقيه هالعمر ضدايا العمر والحمد لله ايش بدنا نسوي